Joe, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and kind of back on campus since I'm enjoying life in uh, a resort in Georgia with six golf courses and kayaks and grandkids. But um, I'm still doing this quite a bit. So, uh, so today we're going to talk about two things and how they merge together. And that's the real critical issue today in medicine and veterinary medicine about antimicrobial resistance. We've seen things like superbugs on fronts of magazines. And the concept or the framework of One Health. A new concept is not new, it's a, it's a regenerized, uh, re-energized concept of a new framework in which to kind of look at this. So uh, I have no conflicts of uh, interest, uh, uh, certainly no financial ones, but I just wanted you to know that. So today we're going to discuss this crisis of antibiotic resistance. So it's antibiotic resistance, body resistance when it's bacteria, it's antimicrobial resistance when it's bacteria, fungi, viruses, etc. So that's kind of the difference when we talk about that. We're gonna explore why this crisis has occurred. We're gonna explore what its impact is on you and on medicine. The idea that it's a wicked problem, what that is and why that means that you have to have a different strategy as we go forward. Explain the concept of One Health and its relevance today to, to medicine. Discuss this national action plan that I've been involved with and many others in terms of the strategy to go forward to address this very complex, vexing problem. And then review, kind of talk a little bit about how the fusion of these come together and its relevance to Ohio State University. And then we'll have some questions and answers. If I get tied up too long, we'll just stop and do questions anyway. <coughs> so <clears throat> it is a crisis by any definition. Over the past few decades, antimicrobial resistance has become a global crisis. The evolution of antibiotic resistance is occurring at an alarming rate. It's outpacing the development of new countermeasures capable of thwarting human and animal infections and diseases. The situation threatens patient care, including yours and mine, and economic growth, public health, agriculture, economic security, national security, and it is threatening the value of antibiotics which have previously transformed medical science. So think of a world in which the antibiotics don't work. Now that's the extreme, but people are talking about that today. And how that has changed all medicine going forward from transplants to cancer therapy, to surgery, to childhood diseases, infant mortality, et cetera, globally. And think what the world would be like if we didn't have these. So the background is this, a very complex multifaceted problem. We're learning how complex it really is a rapidly expanding and accelerating problem, not only in this country, but around the world. Antimicrobial resistance takes place in three domains, within the animal domain, within the human domain, and the environmental domain. And what One Health talks about is how do you connect those domains together in a holistic, integrated strategy moving forward. There's a link between animals and people in many ways, and one of them is transferring antimicrobial resistance from our animals to you either directly or f through the food that's been contaminated that you eat. The environment is, uh, uh, we're understanding much more of a, of a problem than what we thought. And think what you do with antibiotics when you don't complete a therapy. What we do with thousands of pounds of antibiotics in animals that get thrown into the environment. The economic cost of healthcare is growing in the United States at $3 trillion. And this is just adding more money into that healthcare system already under lots of pressure. A changing landscape for animal agriculture, we'll touch on that as we go forward. A national and global issue. And this talk isn't about a scare tactic about being against antibiotics. Rather, it is about what are we gonna do together to address and counter this to make sure antibiotics are available to us as we move into the future, right? So it's kind of interesting to me that Sir Alexander Fleming, uh, who actually by accident discovered penicillin, right, in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in 1945, actually predicted and he stated, the thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of a man or woman who succumbs to infection with penicillin, penicillin resistant organisms. Back in 1945, the founder of penicillin, the first antibiotic that we know of, gave the warning 70 years ago about resistance and worried about that as we move forward. 
There was a report done in the UK by a highly acclaimed and very credible economist named uh, Jim McNeil. And when this report came out, it actually changed the whole strategy of Europe in terms of antimicrobial resistance. And Jim McNeil talked about the following. Right now, worldwide, if 700,000 deaths worldwide due to antimicrobial resistant <coughs> infections. And he said, if the status quo is maintained, we don't do anything about it. By 2050, you could expect 10 million deaths. That's more deaths than we would have for cancer. This is if we don't do anything. The global costs would be estimated to be $100 trillion. Think about that in terms of an overlay of the real impact of this world. And unfortunately, the developing world would be harder hit. Low income, middle income countries that can't afford this, that get infections more frequently and do, actually would be, um, would have a real problem moving forward. So the economic cost in the United States, over 2 million cases right now of antimicrobial resistance, 23,000 deaths just in the United States. That has actually been pushed upward to 44,000, the last stat that I saw. And it cost the United States 20 billion extra dollars a year for prolonged and cost of treatment extended hospital stay, an extra $35 billion for loss of productivity. And right now in the United States, antimicrobial resistant infections means an extra 8 million hospital days, 8 million hospital days a year because of these infections. So that's what the $20 million comes from. For every person that acquires this infection, treated in a medical facility, each person adds 10 to 40,000 extra dollars to their health care bill, just for that episode. So it is a real problem as we move forward and talk about this. As we look at these annual deaths, if we don't do anything about it, according to Jim McNeil, you can see where these deaths occur, especially in Africa, poorer countries, especially in Asia, India, and China, which use more antibiotics than anybody. China almost more than anybody put together. Some in South America, some in North America. So if we're looking at 40,000 deaths, it'll move to 317,000 deaths just in the U.S. So uh, this is the reason that we need to do something about the problem. So new antibiotics approved by FDA. So look at this trend line, and you can see the new approvals by FDA on new antibiotics that have been approved. And look at the trend line. So what's happening is drug companies are opting out of the development of new antibiotics at the very time that the trend line for antibiotic resistance is going up. So those are two trend lines that we really worry about. And so we have a real gap, right? And that gap is resistant bacteria on the rise very rapidly, antibiotics being developed, falling down, and this gap is increasing. So how much does it cost for research and development and approval of a new antibiotic? Between one and one and a half billion dollars. One and one half billion dollars. So here's the R&D investment, sorry. Here's the R&D investment. Billion dollars, a billion and a half dollars. And here's what these companies have to get back for return on their investment, otherwise they're not gonna do it. So pharmaceutical companies are interested in they're making a profit. They're interested in drugs that you use every day. Keep your lipids down, keep your blood pressure down, because that is something that adds to the coffers. Now, there's nothing wrong with the business model. But the business model on this is such that they're really getting out of the business. And the business model is broken. And until we fix that business model, right, those trend lines are going to continue to diverge. The investment, federal government-wise, is not commensurate with the problem. So in FY14 federal budget, we'll see if we get one in the future, who knows. But the spending on antibiotic resistance was approximately $450 million, and that was actually a little bit of an increase in FY14. But it corresponds to $1.40 per person per year. Now here's the biggest problem right now occurring in medicine, right? and we're spending $1.40 per person. So there's something kind of wrong with that model. 
right? And if cooperation can't be fostered, then a post-antibiotic era is inevitable. And this is not a fear tactic. I don't like that. But the trends are inevitably mo moving in that direction, and it is just a wake-up call for us to do something about this issue, right? So what causes antibiotic resistance? I know some of you in the audience are in medicine, so you know. So there are several reasons, right? Overprescribing antibiotics. People, animals, for sure, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Patients not taking antibiotics as prescribed. You got 10 days of Cipro, you take three, you're feeling pretty good, and that's it. Real problem, right? Antibiotic used in agriculture unnecessarily. Are there more antibiotics used in animals or people? Animals by far. And so that is one of the issues because some of those antibiotics are the same one we use for people for critical infections that we need them for. Right? Poor infection control in hospitals and clinics. Right? Poor sanitation, poor biosecurity, just uh, things like poor, poor hygiene. Do you wash your hands anymore? I mean, it just seems like there's some things that we ought to be doing. But that is a problem. And look at the infections we have in hospitals and clinics in settings uh, where sanitation is not followed and these infections continue, right? And lack of a rapid laboratory test. We'll talk about that. So anybody want to hear that wants to make multi-millions of dollars very quickly, just do your research and development to get a rapid, accurate, inexpensive diagnostic test that differentiates viruses from antibiotics. And you would be very rich and hopefully you'd leave Ohio State a little bit but it will be uh, amazing. We don't have that. And so some of the overuse of antibiotics is because we can't differentiate very well. We, we can actually understand and diagnose bacteria, but it takes a little bit longer. It's getting a little bit faster. It's not done on all patients for sure. There's an extra cost. It's hardly ever done in, in animal health. So how do these bacteria get this resistance? Well, we won't go into this because each one of these is about a day uh, lecture. We're not going to do that. So we have, you know, resistant. So here's bacteria, right? Here's susceptible bacteria. And here's a mutation. So these bacteria multiply every 20 to 30 minutes. Think about that. So we, you know, we go through like a 20-year generation and to multiply. They do it every 20 or 30 minutes. So trillions of bacteria are multiplying, and just the natural process, you'll get mutations, right? The roll of the dice is not quite right. The DNA come out, and you get some resistant organisms. And so to move forward, these organisms multiply. Oops. Sorry. Uh, and also, then, the resistant organisms multiply. And when you treat them with antibiotics, right, these disappear. And what's left is the mutated or resisted form, and they go ahead and are out of balance and multiply and infect without control. The other ones are really genetic transfer. It can be very complicated, but in essence, these resistant bacteria will take some of the genetic material and move them, mobile genetic material, and move them into other bacteria. Very clever. So that resistance then changes from Good back bad bacteria to good bacteria, from animal bacteria to human act bacteria, and this genetic movement, moving genes back and forth, is part of the way you get resistance. So that's how it occurs. So it is just this worldwide movement, this huge connexity, which is compl complexity and connection all together, of people, animals, and our environment that are coming together in unprecedented ways we've never seen before. Okay. So they go from animal to animal. They go from animals to pets. They go from pets to people, to wildlife, to the environment, back and forth. And um, you cannot um, actually be removed from them. So in the world of medicine, it's called a resistome. So the resistome is the whole world of resistance and genetic uh, genes so that are resistant genes, right? that are out there and they're flowing back and forth between those domains of humans, animals, and our environment, right? And so they're constantly on the move. The collection of all antibiotic genes 
and their precursors in both pathogens and non-pathogenic bacteria, good and bad, right? They're ancient. They've been around for literally millions of years since bacteria first started. And they reflect the evolution and co-evolution of molecules in the environment of this pressure that takes place. The, the difference is we just haven't seen this much connection before. And it is kind of moving and getting out of hand. So that's the resistome. So if I ask you, you know, how does resistance actually move back and forth? And that's why this one health idea is so important, right? So resistance moves horizontally and vertically. It moves within species. It moves across species lines, basically animals and people. It moves in the environment. It moves in our food, right? As contaminants in food with resistant genes and organisms. It moves in our water supply, in our sewer systems, <clears throat> in our um, water systems, in multiple human settings, whether they're in hospitals or um, extended care facilities, what have you, right? And all of this attributes to the risk. So it's a very complicated, complex, convoluted kind of uh, a process. What you can't do anymore is to say, well, we're going to deal with this in humans. And then find out, well, wait a minute, that's only one little bit of that you know, framework. So if we don't do something about this in our environment and in our animals, right, we're not going to have much of, a, of, of an impact. So we have to look at all three. And that's the idea of changing the framework to one health. Pathways, the antibiotics to the environment. This is what we're learning about right now that is um, pretty consequential. As we move from animals and people and our hospitals and humans, and we have waste from all of these animals and manure, and they're spread back in the water system and on soils and in sewage and sludge, and it moves into our aquacultures, and basically you can't get away from it. It's a huge issue. Okay, so this is about outpatient antibiotic prescribing. So we'll talk a little bit about use. So these are outpatients. These aren't use of antibiotics within the hospital or, or care settings, right? So, so th these are the folks that prescribe antibiotics. Primary care physicians, 45%. And then you have OBGYN, you have surgical specialties, um, nurse practitioners, physician assistants. You can kind of get an idea of where we've come from. Almost 10% of all antibiotics prescribed by dentists. Any dentists in the audience? Okay, so that's about 30 million doses a year. Something we hadn't thought about. Well, we thought about them. So this is when I'm going to put your thinking hat on and you figure this out, because I think we figured it out, but we're not sure. So in these outpatient settings, right, this is when you go to your physician or go to CVS and get X, Y, and Z, right? Here are the usage rated by regions. So how many, and this, is, this, this data is about six years old. So if you look and see, the national rate of use is 258 million courses or doses of antibiotics in the United States per year. So a little what? A little over 300 million people. So that's about a dose per person per year. About. But when you look at prescribing, the South prescribes 936 courses per thousand people. And if you're on the West Coast, it's 638 courses. The diseases aren't different. So why is that? What does your, here's by the way the Midwest is not really great. So we're just understanding a little bit about that uh, and why that, why that big difference occurs, right? And it really is about culture. It really is about joining a practice or your mentor talking to you about what we use, how we, how we prescribe in this clinic or in this practice. So it's, it's kind of interesting to look at as we move forward. So the other big change is, anybody know what microbiome is? Heard microbiome? You know what microbiome <laughs> So we have more cells on the outside of our body and inside of our gut in particular than we do that make up all the cells in our human body. So it's called the microbiome. And we're learning that the balance of bacteria and organisms in that microbiome 
have a lot to say about our health. And the connectivity between these bacteria uh, and how they colonize and uh, their balance, right, have a, have a lot to do with our health. But what we're now learning more and more is that, that's your personal resistome, is that a weekly course of antibiotics can alter your microbiome for up to one year. So think about that next time you take antibiotics. Take antibiotics when you need them. I will, but, but think about the change that takes place and how long it takes to kind of get that microbiome back in shape. And when it gets out of kind of balance, you get infections like Clostridium difficile that decide that when broad spectrum antibody is given to you and Clostridium difficile is resistant, it kills off the good guys and the resistance takes over and that multiplication takes place, you get very sick very quickly. So just an example of the importance of understanding this microbiome as, as we move forward. So what about animal health? So I've been more involved in animal health. <clears throat> Extensive use in antibiotics in animal agriculture, we treat, treat, prevent, promote growth. Practices produce resistance for animals through a variety of mechanisms, but largely through contamination of our environment and water through manure and also through our food supply. Okay. So um, how many antibiotics are used on our animals? Well, uh, worldwide, 64,000 tons of antibiotics are used in the animal sector. That's 126 million pounds of antibiotics. So how much of that you think goes in the environment or comes into your system? And in the United States, it's about 30 million pounds. Okay? It's a lot more than used in humans, right? And so that finds its way through the resistome and the environment and through the food to you and I. So that's why we need a strategy in our animals as a preventive of what's happening in us, right? And if we look at 2030, they estimate 210 million pounds of usage. And the reason is that our animals, which we produced last year, 40 billion B, 40 billion food animals produced around the world to feed 7 billion people moving to 10. And we're gonna to need to increase that by 50% in 12 years. 60 billion animals, billion, produced per year, right? And think of the antibiotics, well, I know the antibiotics that are being used. And one of the problems was we use these antibiotics to promote growth. Found out a long time ago, if you sprinkle some antibiotics in animals' feed, they get fatter quicker. Wow, really? Yes, and you can do it where it's less costly than the, rat, you know, the return on the investment of that extra weight gain. So that's why you see 80% of the antibiotics used in animals. Well, there's a problem with that because they also build resistance. These organisms do, right? So a year and a half ago in the United States, the FDA came forward and said, we're no longer permitting in the United States the use of medically important antibiotics to promote growth in animals. Out, banned. It was done in Europe five years earlier. We need to do it internationally. So that is a huge change in the landscape and a reduction in the use of antibiotics that uh, we, we haven't had until a year ago. So it's been one of the strategies moving forward. Animal consumption of antibiotics, here they are, especially in China, uh, India, quite a bit in Europe and, and the US, but you give you some idea of kind of what that looks like. So it's a, it's a worse problem globally than it is here. It's hard to believe, but it is, right? And the reason is lack of basic healthcare and infrastructure. So I've spent a lot of time when I was with CDC and the USDA of traveling in, different, in many different countries. And they don't have the same healthcare and infrastructure, of course, you, many of you have traveled worldwide that we do. They have low rates of vaccination. So vaccination for bacterial diseases are one of the key strategies. Because if you prevent those diseases, you don't use antibiotics. So they don't have access to them or use them very well. Inadequate clean water 
indiscriminate use over the counters. You don't need a prescription in most of these countries. So, you know, the last time I was uh, in Southeast Asia, you could walk into any kind of, quote, store and buy them. You don't know if they're real or not, but you could buy them. Substandard quality, limited availability of new drugs, the same overseas as it is here, no new antibiotics being created. Shortage of trained healthcare providers. Okay. So, real issue globally. And because of our interconnected world, right, of people, of food, right, the resistance that takes place overseas finds its way here. So there's an economic theory about all of this, and I just kind of threw this in for economists in the crowd. because I don't understand it too well, but it's very interesting. It's called the tragedy of the commons. It's a metaphor to understand this intertwined challenges spawned by accelerated scale of human activity. And basically what it says is that we have a dilemma where individual rational behavior, so you're thinking about doing something rationally for the short term, right, can cause long-term harm collectively. It happens in energy. That's one of the things that we see. Uh, but think about that is that when you and I are making decisions, or your physician, or dentist, et cetera, which is fine, or your veterinarian, right? you make decisions about the short term and about that individual. But collectively, for 330 million people in the US, or 7 billion people, collectively, long term, it becomes a problem or a tragedy of the commons. So for every complex problem, there's an answer. It's clear, it's simple, and it's wrong. Shell Mintkin said that. And that's true with this, and that's why our old strategies of dealing with this goes. This is a wicked problem. The wicked problems come out of a business kind of uh, understanding. They're complex, unprecedented. They don't have easy solutions or answers. And the most important thing is, often unique and past experiences are not helpful. So trying to solve new problems that are complex, difficult, and vexing with old solutions are not working. And that's why a new framework needs to come forward. And that's what we're talking about then in um, One Health. So let's move our strategy over to One Health. Has anybody ever heard of, how many here have heard of One Health? You have? No. Okay, oh, I, well, we've got to get this. Uh, you've heard of it. No, okay. So this is a teachable moment. So this is a uh, global trend, right, of emerging diseases. So in the last 60 years, um, this, this woman, Kate Jones, published in Nature, a retrospective study of emerging or re-emerging diseases in the world. And she said over the last 60 years, 335 new diseases have come forward. We've never seen anything like that, especially over the last 30 years. By the way, this is the decade of HIV. We had a lot of new other infections that were that coincided. These are the white parts of these bars as they move upwards are antimicrobic resistant bacteria. So she believes that about 21% of all new emerging infections she would categorize as antimicrobial resistance, right? So think about that. I won't go into all of this, but these are just around the world, all of these emerging zoonoses. Zoonoses are diseases transmitted from animals to people. And of the 1,400 diseases that we know, the causative agent and pathogens, 60% come from animals. And of those 335 newly found emerging and re-emerging problems, it's 70%. So 70% of human infections come from or through animals. Ebola, Lyme, West Nile, influenza. Anybody know where influenza starts? Ducks, pigs, people in southern China. That is the great mixing bowl of the next potential epidemic, right? So those are some examples that we see worldwide. So it's, this comes out of the National Academy of Sciences as the convergence model. And it's the idea that genetic factors, biological factors, social, political, ecological, and environmental factors have all now collided in ways that we've not seen before those collisions are most, mostly anthropogenic, what we've done to the earth and to ourselves and our decision making. And they've created the perfect microbial storm. 
but instead of occurring once every 100 years as the great typhoon or hurricane, they occur multiple times a year. And in the middle of putting all that together, in the center of emerging infectious diseases in people and in animals that we've never seen before at this rate, including antibiotic resistant organisms. So if you were a microbe, right, this would be the happiest time as you could have. This is club med for microbes, right? They, they can move across species lines very easily, and they do, right? They move around the world faster than the incubation period. So I can be on a plane in Singapore, and in 20 hours, I can be talking to you. Who knows what I'm bringing along? So it happens very quickly, uh, and we are all interconnected, and these microbes really like it, and they're taking resistance worldwide. So when you travel internationally, you are also a vector of resistance, bringing it back to your family, to the country. So what's the dynamics here? So this is one health, these domains, this of animals and animal products and food, human health, environmental health. And it, it reminds me of you know, the Newton's third law of motion <clears throat> that said the essence for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we live in a world so connected today that if you do something in the environment, it impacts human and animals. If you do something in animal health, it impacts humans in the environment. So that interconnectedness, right, is also a description of what happening with our antibiotic resistance as we move forward. So pathogens and genes cross through human, animal, and environmental interfaces with far more ease than highly educated professionals, public health, and animal health organizations. So I've worked in both. It happens. So our remarkable interconnectedness of people, of animals, of food, in a rapidly changing, increasingly vulnerable environment has created a 21st century mixing bowl that favors the continuation of emerging and re-emerging diseases, including new resistant pathogens. And also, although the result and impact are predictable, our response continues to be reactive and silent. We continue to put, we continue to train in our special areas, rather than a step back and understand the ecology of what these diseases are, and they have to be attacked very differently. So what is One Health? And we've been talking about it. The collective effort of multiple disciplines, working locally, nationally, and globally, to attain optimal health of humans, animals, and our environment. So that's the one thing I want you to take home today. Right. Ah, our world is so interconnected that new strategies have come forward, and they're holistic, and they're integrated, and they involve disciplines from veterinary medicine, human medicine, dentistry, to nursing, to agriculture, to social sciences, et cetera, to start to understanding these difficult problems. So why should we adopt One Health, right? Well, better problem definition allows more effective allocation of resources. So if the problem's really in animals and all the antibiotics going there, the solution is not wait for that disease to end up in our hospitals. I mean, it's almost too obvious. <clears throat> so we have to go to the point. Wicked problems demand new solutions. We're connected horizontally, but we think and organize vertically. And it's very, all of you are, are in academe, it sounds like departments. Right? I mean, we're so into kind of our areas of specialty that we forget that we need to take it, to look at these problems differently. One Health broadens the engagement and support beyond health and science. A lot to do with behavior change. <laughs> Certainly prescribing patterns uh, are about behavior. Improving animal environmental health is a public health strategy. So if we actually reduce resistance in those two mains, domains, it's a public health strategy because we improve health in people and reduce it there. So the best way, I'll examine is rabies. The United States does not have canine rabies. We have other bat rabies and raccoon rabies. No canine rabies because of a vaccination program that's been put in place, and now we don't have to worry about canine rabies. Right? That is a veterinary strategy in terms of operations. It's a public health benefit. So now you see this connectedness. Reducing costs and emphasize prevention and moving closer to the problems. All right, so, so this is the National Plan of Action. So uh, just really quickly, so this is the strategy now the United States is working on. 
All the federal agencies are working together under these five different strategies. So I should have asked you what you do beforehand, but very quickly, slow the emergence of resistant bacteria to make sure that we can use them longer. And it's called stewardship. And stewardship is just the idea of an, algo of an algorithm or a thought process that you go through to say, should I use an antibiotic or not? If I do, is it the right one? If it's the right one, is it the right dose? If it's the right dose and the right one, have I the proper route of, you know, is it oral, is it IV, how am I going to use it? And there are there side effects? And you need to go through that stewardship process before you actually use antibiotics. And so there's a big effort at CDC and even in veterinary medicine now to train all new professionals in the healthcare systems about the importance of stewardship and give them a basis to do that. Strengthen one health surveillance, lack of data. So if we don't have any good data about the resistome, where are we going to put our solutions uh, and our investment? Advancing diagnostic tests. So it too, takes too long and it's too expensive. We don't use them properly. And if we're using antibiotics for viruses, it doesn't work. That means you're using antibiotics unnecessarily. CDC says in human medicine that between 30 and 50% of all antibiotics either shouldn't be used or used improperly. Think about that. So that's why this stewardship becomes so important. More research, certainly for vaccines and alternatives to antibiotics. That's where a lot of the action is today. <clears throat> and to do this uh, collaboratively around the world. All right, so we add a million people to the face of the earth every week. Wow. And what that means in terms of food production is that we need to produce more food over the next 40 years than we have during our last 500. Increase in wealth. So how many more animals and how much more, back, how much more antibiotics are we going to use in order to get that done? So it becomes you know, a real issue. And animals, you know, so if animals have infections, here's what we do. We use antibiotics. We use better management, um, better biosecurity, use vaccines, and, and we build up the host. It's called immunomodulation, ways of actually building our cells or our host up to be able to fight off resistant organisms better. And there's a huge amount of activity doing this. And now the use of antibiotics in animals is being scrutinized, and it should be, to be used only necessarily and only for infection and not for growth promotion. OK, so we're going to end up on these vexing problems. So what makes this, so, so this will spin your head around going home tonight, right? So the war of antibiotics can never be won. Resistance is innate. It's part of what bacteria do. However, important battles can be won. And those battles are slowing um, resistance, so we use our antibiotics longer. New discovery of antibiotics as we move ahead. Judicious use. Knowing the right thing to do but not doing it. So why do we have 30% more subscriptions, prescriptions than necessary? So we know better if we continue to do that. This economic theory. Fixing the business model. So if we don't do something with pharmaceutical companies who are not going to produce new antibiotics, right, that is a business model that's broken. So we're saying to pharmaceutical companies, produce more antibiotics. I know it costs you a billion and a half dollars. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we're doing stewardship, so we're actually not going to use them as much. So there's whole new kinds of innovative models being put forward to incentivize companies to do that. And I think you will see in the next year or two whole new models of business that will incentivize these companies to move ahead. Added costs to our health care, it's a complex issue. Trying to explain this to the public is not easy, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're faculty, you're educated, you know all these things, right? But to the general public, it is really hard to explain. All right, lots of voices, lots of blaming. This movement of pathogens and genes you know, uh, through the resistome is very, very complex. But there are strategies that we need to put in place to stop that. It's more serious overseas than it is, than it is here. And one other thing, I went to this store the other day, just a quick. And in this store, this was a supermarket, Publix. It's in Georgia. Uh, and I walked in, and uh, the pharmacy says, uh, free antibiotics free 
antibiotics. Now, you have to have a prescription, but they don't cost anything. So just kind of, it's like Halloween, just load up. And then I walked around the other corner, and there's the meat display, and there's big signs up and said, no antibiotics ever used to produce these chickens. Oh, all the antibiotics you want here, and, and over here, you're not allowed to use them. Anyway, it, it's a problem in marketing and understanding, and I hate that because it's about judicious use of antibiotics. So I've been in chicken houses where there's been between 800,000 and a million and a half broilers, birds, right? And they get sick. And you can tell me that you're not going to raise them with antibiotics and tell the public what happens when they get sick. It's not pretty. You have to use antibiotics. So something that we, you know, it's, it's an issue. No good public face. We haven't been able to attack this like tobacco or HIV, where people personally understand that and take the responsibility. By the way, stewardship's partly your responsibility and mine. Molded discipline actions, absolutely right. So Albert Einstein said it, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So One Health is a new solution, a new strategy as we move forward. forward. So this exquisitely interconnection has to take place in, in ways that we change how we're organized. Improving environmental health and, pup and animal health is a strategy. If we focus on one of those domains of One Health, we're only working on one-third of the problem. Well, that's going to be a waste until we start understanding that the strategy is moving all together. It's a thought process that brings us all together. So what should you do? So have an informed discussion with your caregivers. Uh, it's not that you shouldn't use antibiotics, but have that discussion. Is this the right thing to do? And are there, are there adverse reactions? And can we kind of talk about this uh, together as we make this decision? Physicians, nurses should make the decision, but that conversation is important. Understand when you travel and, and foods that come into your house, all, also a method of disseminating microbes and, and resistance, right? There's a significant changes to your microbiome every time you choose antibiotics. Now, sometimes you need antibiotics, and I do too, and we're going to have them. But it does change our internal system where we actually have resistance moving from pathogens to commensurals or good bugs, I guess, in our body, right? So we have wonderful benefits to antibiotics. We just have to make sure we use them right. Good kinds of uh, practice of hygienes. And the last two slides are about new science. So this is about innovation and about different strategies. So a white paper came out of MIT the other day, and it's talked about um, the three major profound changes of transformations of biomedical science. This is contemporary, the last 20 years. Molecular biology, number one. Second, genomics. The third, convergence science. Convergence science. Convergence science is the intellectual cross-pollination. To be wonderful for a group of people that have been in faculty all these years. The essence of One Health is more and more being recognized as a convergent science creating a new culture, ecosystems, incentives to bring relevant sectors together and establish new frameworks that integrate knowledge from many disciplines. One Health isn't about just meeting together. It's promoting a true exchange of mindsets, leading to fundamentally different approaches to understand and respond to contemporary problems and health challenges. It's the life sciences, um, you, know, you know, meeting the physical sciences, meeting social sciences and agriculture. And at Ohio State, this is the last slide. This is what we want to do here, right? So it's the purpose of a land grant mission. Difficult problems, understanding what the solutions are, and putting them back in our communities to improve health. You have to do that as an integrated strategy. We have seven health science colleges, the only campus in the United States with seven health science colleges on the same campus only one. You can walk back and forth between med, med, vet med, nursing, and pharmacy, and uh, human medicine. Uh, and we need to start taking advantage of that kind of integration 
on this campus. It focuses an entire university on critical overarching themes with very significant societal um, outcomes and relevance. One Health is fundamental to the discovery theme. Before I left, I worked on the discovery themes. The idea of putting $450 million to work for, uh, <laughs> for multidiscipline collaboration and convergence. We just didn't call it that. But that's what it is, right? So it's the essence of convergent science. I think it's the essence of what we're going to have at Ohio State. So great opportunities. So that's my story. You've, uh, we've talked about the crisis. We've talked about the five steps that need to work. We've talked about a new framework that now you know what One Health is. And that new strategy then that's been put together to offer new solutions and in innovative ways to stop this very um, vexing and difficult problem that we all face. So thanks for your attention. And Mary Jo, if you have any questions, we'll try to answer them. that are used in the animal industry versus antibiotics that are used for human use. In other words, specifically, the microorganisms that are being treated or prophylactically given in the animal population, are they similar, the same, or different from the human population? So, so they're both. Uh, so, so there's a whole group of uh, antibiotics in animals called ionophores that don't have any um, human counterpart. And, and so far that hasn't been a problem. But there are medically important antibiotics that you and I need that are also used in our animals. Some of them inappropriately. And I'm also talking about small animals. Pets. We've got 90 million dogs and 95 million cats. So they all use antibiotics. So that's a, a very key issue, is that we have, so like CDC says, we need to find new antibiotics and put them on the shelf and only use this group of antibiotics for multi-drug resistant antibiotics that nothing else works on. Do not use these in animals. Separate them out, keep them there. It's our armamentarium in case we really need them. So we're trying to move away from using the same antibiotics and if we use the same antibiotics, they have to be used judiciously. Great talk. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, an antibiotic called rifaximin that's used, it's non-absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, but is effective in treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. But this treatment is going to, reply, going to require continuous treatment. The antibiotic. Continuous should use. Be, should there be legislation against such use of antibiotics? Yeah. So, so I don't think there. Yeah, I don't think there should be legislation. I think it's. I think it's um, the. You know, we have highly trained, highly educated healthcare providers. I think rather than try to legislate, which I'd be against, it is understanding the pros and cons of that use. So, if you need this to have a, improve your life, then you need it. But here are the side effects that we need to monitor as we make this decision. Let's you and I do this together. Uh, in terms of legislation, no, there is a legislative active action in FDA to prevent the use of antibiotics for growth promotion. So that was a regulatory. But I'm against using, having people regulate and taking the decisions out of the hands of professionals. Uh, Dean, uh, in relation to the resistance to antibiotics in the last 20, 30 years, how much money we got from the pharmaceutical companies, particularly the companies which make antibiotics, is there some relationship? Are they providing us more funds for the research in relation to the very dramatic resistance? So a great question, and, and my answer is, without stepping on a bunch of toes, is that they need to be better partners. Uh, here's the case. Uh, we understand the problem. 
I think that part of their R&D needs to go into understanding this resistance issue as, as well. And at the same time, the federal government is putting in just minimal amounts of things. I can remember when we had uh, two cases of Ebola, we spent $2 billion. And we barely got to $400 million in antimicrobial resistance. So it's a partnership. Federal government shouldn't be able to do it by itself. But I think the pharmaceutical companies that are making money on this should help in more in the partnerships of R&D. And when you see the new strategies that are going to come forward in terms of that business model, that's going to be put in the business model. It's a very good point. So there's increasing resistance to current antibiotics, and yet there are fewer antibiotics being new ones, presumably, being approved. Is it because we've run out of space? Are there not antibiotics that can be developed that will not uh, have the resistance? So, so I, 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 think that, I, I think it's just that the R&D is drying up. So there's lots of molecules. There's lots of natural um, uh, molecules and materials that we've yet to find. And, and the reason is that these companies don't find it to be an incentive for them to actually do this. The idea that there's not any to come down the pipeline is not true. I think we could put 10 in the pipeline pretty quickly and follow them through because of new molecules that are being tested. A lot of them were tested and just stopped. So I, I think uh, there are plenty of molecules out there that can be converted into do antibiotics if they, we incentivize people to do that. Is the research and the experimentation that is needed for uh, something like One Health being supported by foundations and federal agencies at an appropriate level? So it's, a, it's a great question. If we're all of a sudden appreciating convergent science and putting disciplines together, what's the incentive? Right. So the National Institute, well, National Institutes of Health I've, um, are great and they got wonderful people, but they're not doing a very good job on that. Uh, they're, they're so specialized, you know, I mean, so they have their own institutes. And their own institutes are focused on their own institutes and issues. And they have not stepped back in a way to say, you know, part of this is we got to put these institutes together and look at new strategies. So universities need to be incentivized that way uh, much more. So this whole idea of, I mean, this campus, like a lot of them, are struggling to put disciplines back together, right? And one way to do that is, somebody said, you know, the best way to herd cats, I'm a veterinarian, the best way to herd cats is to put the bull in the middle. So if we funded that, I think people would come forward in a way. So it's a really good point. For the first time, the National Institutes of Health actually have a, um, actually had some One Health proposals. So maybe they heard you. And a few decades ago, there was a lot of talk about zero population growth, and this was scoffed at as being naively Malthusian, uh, the concerns. Uh, but now we're creating, we're now we're building these huge factory farms that to feed the population. Do you, think, do you think there's a feasible solution to this problem independent of zero population growth or some, some severe cap on population growth. Well, yeah, boy, uh, I'm a veterinarian, so I'm not going to <laughs> I'll steer clear. It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, we're up to 60 billion food animals coming out. So the reason that is is that some of the poorer countries are increasing wealth, relative term, and one of the first things they do when they increase wealth is that they demand protein from animal sources for good and for bad. But what is happening and then is this convergence is actually spinning around faster. So as we go from seven to 10 billion people by the middle of the, the century, and all of these new animals, I mean, something has to break. Um, and you know, I study epidemics. And right now, um, the biomass of the human population is 1,000 times greater than the biomass of any other species, other than the cattle that we use and eat ourselves. And it has never been that far off of a balance before some catastrophic event occurred. So my guess is we won't be able to um, stop human population growth, but nature will do it. I hate to say that, but it's true. I'd like to inject something that something good. Old, that is old and tried and successful. 
The thing that has saved populations, all populations, ours and the world population, is public health. Yep. That is the control of fecal matter, the cleanliness of water, the cleanliness of food, and the separation of animal populations, including the human as an animal. So a nursing home can be as dangerous as a feedlot. A hospital can be as dangerous as a wandering herd. The thing is, we have to stick to basics. That means we have to figure out the, how to handle all the fecal material that is coming from human animals and animal animals, how to handle that in a way that it doesn't come back to us in our water supplies. And that makes great difficulty when you have floods. Um, when we had a flood in Ohio back some years ago in southern Ohio, every water system was contaminated. And if it weren't for uh, the beer company up here bottling water or canning water, uh, people would have been in desperate straits. If you go to foreign countries, the thing that is missing is public health. That is, you don't control the feces, the water supply is not controlled, vaccination, all of these things have been what has decreased contagion throughout the world. And we seem to forget about that. We want to jump to exciting new things. We have to control our personal cleanliness, the cleanliness in our families, the cleanliness in our kitchen. You cannot cut up fresh chicken meat on the same cutting board that you use for your salad. They have to be separated. So good kitchen health can keep things clean. Um, and if you want to look at the United States as to where public health has been abandoned, look at Southern California. Epidemic hepatitis A spread by fecal material. 100 cases of typhus. Typhus. Typhus is the disease of filth, which is now being spread in Southern California. So we have examples of where public health has been abandoned, and the results are bad. Now, those people are going to be treated with antibiotics, and hopefully the death rate won't match the sickness rate. But think of how many people come from California to adjacent states. How much vegetable matter comes from the fields of California, serviced by a population of workers that are exposed to fecal material. So always the basics must be followed. They cannot be abandoned. So that was a... Never fix what's on top of it. That was in the, 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 the message. Uh, that's, that's tough before you eat to have that conversation. but. Um, it's absolutely true. So the two most fundamental economic things you can do to slow this problem down are stewardship, better decisions about use, misuse, judicious use, and infection prevention. And infection prevention is the cheapest way to prevent infection where you, never, where you don't use antibiotics to begin with. So it's, uh, your soliloquy is perfect. Thank you.